Hi guys, Natalie here, Only One United. It's a big debate kind of thing tonight. Just looking to sort of grow our knowledge with you guys, with us. I'm here with Andy and Kudzi. Andy, thanks for joining us. Do you want to tell people a bit about yourself? Yeah, it's good to be back and good to have football back coming this weekend. Uh, I've supported United as the club since I was a child. Supported United women right from the new beginning in 2018. And we're a fanzine for the club as well. Uh, hopefully sharing anybody and everybody's views, no matter what they are, and getting getting fan views out there uncensored. Yeah, definitely. And I hope I said it right. Was it right? Could Yeah, could see. Could see. Yeah. Um, just want to introduce yourself and um, tell people a bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so right off the bat, I'm a Liverpool fan. So if there's any Liverpool fans mm-hmm. watching, I doubt it. But <laughs> if you're there, hi, how are you? Um, so basically, I've been, uh, how long has it been? Maybe about six, seven years now, I've been covering um, women's football and uh, predominantly in North America because that's where I'm. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Well, sort of just outside Toronto, Canada. But yeah, I've been doing it for a while. And um, essentially, that uh, European leagues, stuff like that. Um, right now, you can find me at 04XI or 0411, which is an SB Nation site that covers women's football. So, and I, I didn't put my Twitter handle, but it's basically Kudzi, my first name, M88. That's where you can yeah, find me. It's yeah. running along the bottom, guys. So I did put mine, Andy, and Kudzi. So if you ever need to get it, just pause the video and see it and definitely go and follow both these guys here. And obviously, drop a like on the video as we're talking. So the reason why I've decided to get these two guys on and just talk about this today is basically... <laughs> Sporty Mutt Sport Face, you've chosen the wrong weekend to admit you're a Liverpool fan. It's a big, uh, big derby Sunday for, for the women's team. Oh, I'm going to act like I can't see it. <laughs> I'll just take the final score. I, I, like, because of the timing and everything, I probably won't be able to watch the match. It'll be pretty early for me. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can I just touch a quick one as well? Because you've got you and you're from Canada. You just admitted it. Jade Riviera, I think I said her name right. Good player. Mm-hmm. We're hearing very positive things about Man United and yeah, Jay Rivera. Yeah. She, what would your opinion be? Yeah, um, I actually think she's she is a very good player. Um, she still has a little bit of developing to do. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen um, Team Canada play, but um, they usually have her on the right or the left, and they have Ashley Lawrence on the right or the left, right? So they usually play together. Um, Lawrence is definitely more developed in terms of just overall game and her ability and stuff. But Riviera is is just, I think with enough time and with enough coaching and patience, she could be just as good as, as Lauren. She's, she's a pretty good player. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. So that's, so yes, uh, yes. If you get her, it's a good signing. (laughs) We love it. We love it. We love it. Uh, Anyway, no, no, just coming back to why I do this. Cause I think on Twitter, it's it's probably not the best place to get your opinions, but sometimes (laughs) it's, sometimes it's not. I've seen a lot of talk about, Mark this, we don't like him, we want him out. And um, no, we need to back the manager 100%. And I, and I think for me, it's, it's more nuanced. I think, especially in the women's game, in the mm. men's game, I totally understand that as a men's fan, you've got to back the manager 100%. And, yeah. you know, it shouldn't be about player power. And I'm not saying that players, are, you know, but I think in the men's game, we sort of know that players are respected. Look at the money they're getting. And, you know, we know that there's all this kind of energy put into making sure players feel happy and, and welcome and protected in the men's game. Whereas in the women's game, we're seeing around the world that it's not really happening. And I think maybe some WSL fans or Man United fans don't really know that. And they think, oh, you know, it's Man United. Everyone's sort of looked after. I'm not saying they're not, by the way. This yeah. is not me. Yeah. Seeing yeah, yeah. Anything bad's happening at Man United. I, this is just a generic chat. And that's why I got Kudzi on, because she knows about Mark's time in Orlando. And obviously what's just gone... Well, what's happening what's, mm. what's in the news currently in America and the NWSL is the Yates report, and yeah. it sort of made me think. Well, if if there are, you know, we need to listen to be listening to players. We need to be protecting players, and just could see your take on, I suppose, a fan's view of 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 you know backing a manager one hundred percent because we have seen it. We have seen owners sort of covering for managers and they've done some very undesirable things so just you you take it away you're the you you've got the knowledge yeah. I suppose, more than me and Andy on this 
It, it is it is a tricky one because um, you do want to give a manager uh, time to be able to implement their plan, to put together the players they need. Like, for example, with Mark Skinner in the situation, um, you know, he's still relatively new, so to speak, at Manchester United. Not new to the league because, you know, he was there before, but new to Manchester United. So he's still kind of trying to put together everything in terms of his players, his tactics, um, whatever backing he's getting from the board. I wouldn't know. I'm not a United fan, so I don't know how much backing he has. But, you know, all that kind of stuff that comes into play. But at the same time, and, and this is how the women's game differs from, from the men's. So in the men's game, players are much more protected, like you mentioned. They have enough money, enough people around, around them, enough like management, lawyers, whatever, to be able to protect the player. Sometimes to the detriment of the club, but that's another discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the women's game, because it's still developing, not a lot of players have that kind of power. And even the players you think have that kind of power have come across some serious roadblocks. And I'll get into it a little bit later, especially with the Sally Yates report. But people, a player who you thought, you know what, if this person speaks up, something is going to happen. They spoke up, nothing happened. So it shows you that even with like one of the most prominent players uh, in that league, in that, um, in the, for example, the player I'm talking about is Kristen Press in the uh, U U.S. Women's National Team. If she can speak up and nothing is done, then what about people who don't even have near the notoriety that she has, right? So when it comes to fans, I would say just from a general fan point of view, and then I'll say media point of view as well, but from a general point of view, I think we need to listen when players talk. And it's not easy because we're, especially if you've been watching the sport for a long time, you're conditioned to think that any time a player speaks, nine times out of 10, it's just them trying to look after themselves, their money, they're being selfish, right? Because that's usually in the men's game, that's what happens a lot. Whereas in the women's game, it's the f complete opposite, right? They have prominent players come. Yeah, someone just mentioned the Spanish national team, right? You have people who, I mean, who doesn't know who Alexia Pateas is at this point? She's coming out in support of certain things that have happened within that team and no backing from the federation, right? So when it comes to the women's game, I would say that fans do need to pay attention because like we saw in the NWSL, players came forward. They weren't listened to. They were traded. They were like, and again, this comes to like the rules in the NWSL, which are very not player friendly, but you can get traded, right? You speak up for something, you get traded. And then everyone is told, even media, they're told that you were a problematic player and that's why you got traded when that's far from the truth. So I would say as fans and as media, as myself, I'm in media. If a player speaks up, we got to have to take it seriously and listen to what they're saying. And then after that, if we can do some digging, see what we can find out. Then after that, when we have a more complete picture, then we can say, hmm, maybe something else is going on here that we're not sure of. But I'm of the opinion now that if a player speaks up, we should listen. Mm. No, definitely, and I'm seeing. I mean, Andy, what's your point? Did you know about what was going on in the? I mean, Vicky saying Kristen Press was frozen out and then forced to play in Sweden, and that was from speaking out about mm. abuse. I don't think it was like. I mean, we know it's gone to extremes, sexual abuse and things like that. But I don't think with Kristen Press, it was just sort of. Well, was it the verbal? Um, um so with Kristen Press, uh, unfortunately for her, it's happened twice in her career. Um, in the US. So the very first time was when she had just come out of college. She had just been drafted um, into a team of that particular league, which is now defunct. But um, that team was Magic Jack. Uh, for those of you who know about Magic Jack, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't look it up, the owner was very, very problematic. And he basically, because of everything he was doing, ended up being the catalyst that led to the downfall of the league. Uh, so she left the league after after it got uh, disbanded. She left. She went to Sweden. She was playing in Sweden for a while, and then when she now wanted to come back and play for the national team, they basically told her, and this is hearsay. I'm going to say allegedly, right? Because there's no full proof, like factual evidence out there. But allegedly, she was told by the powers that be that unless you come back and play in the league, you won't be considered for the national team. And then the second time it occurred is when she was now in Chicago. Um, again, if you look up the Sally H report, if you look up the investigation that was done by the, the joint investigation that was done by the NWSL and the NWSL Players Association, it'll go into more detail about that. But if you look that up, you'll see what she had to encounter. And it wasn't her in particular, but she was trying to stand up for players on the team and it went nowhere. And then she got traded. So yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Unfortunately for her, it's happened more than once. 
Yeah. I mean, Andy, I just want to suppose bring bring you in. I don't know how much you know about the the Sally Yates report and what happened in um in the NWSL. And there was a question I want to ask, but you know, obviously Peter saying treatment, disgrace, treat people proper, but I don't think it's it. This kind of treatment of players is just exclusively an NWSL problem. I think it's happening all over. I mean, I'm right. I said about the Spain. I mean, just what's your view? Of, I mean, when you suppose you're seeing these things and you're hearing it, and, and I suppose comparison to men's game. I think it's it's not even just a football thing. I think, mm. I mean, employee laws in Britain are a lot better than in America, mm. and have been for a long time. How long yeah. that'll last with the current government, we don't know. But for now, <laughs> it's it's pretty good. Uh, I'm. You know, I've I've been in trade unions and and gone on strike for for better paying conditions for not just myself but other other groups and other people, and I think that's what's necessary. I know in men's football there's the PFA. I assume they take women members as well. But professional it's, only, they're professional only. Yeah, so you've got that issue. Um, even that, a union. There's a union which is the body, and there's a union which is the group of people within the union they're different entities and they've got to work together to represent and support so even the things that are in place even in britain where in theory we've got better employment law it's still you're still relying on somebody to back you to support you to see value in joining your side when you speak out mm. and i would hope that i mean it shouldn't take an international victory to to do this but with the image of women's football in britain at the minute you would hope that if somebody speaks out, they'd get the backing. But you can never guarantee it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's needed. A proper, solid membership of of a union, whether that's just a group of players getting together and saying, we will not take this, or whether it is an organised thing. That's important anywhere, in any job, in any country. But you've got to be listened to. You know, I've done interviews in, in the fanzine with ex-United players from before they were closed down. And it feels like forever ago, but it's not that long ago. It was 2005, it was closed down. And the players were playing in men's kits from the season before, far too big. They weren't considered, they were considered fortunate guests. And that's that's this century. And, you know, we've come a long way since then, but attitudes haven't. Appearances have, but attitudes, attitudes are easy to hide. Until it comes to the crunch, and you either need to back somebody or, or sack them. Yeah. So we, the fact is, we just don't know what the situation is, and whether the support is there. It feels like somebody speaking out in our country would be supported, but you just don't know. Yeah. And there are yeah. plenty of people still in roles that are of the old school. I have no doubt about that. And you just hope there's enough with. It shouldn't be modern morals, but unfortunately they are. To to support what needs to be supported and, and make sure people are held accountable for, for the duty of care that they hold. No, 100%. And I mean, that's where I suppose I want to come in with this point from Anton a bit further up, where he says, I suppose, this is the thing, isn't it? Then you don't want it to go fully, I suppose, like this, an mm. Mbappe, uh, 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 Ronaldo, where they're holding the club to ransom on things. And I don't know if, if you know, could see or Andy, and obviously we don't want it going that way. But do, yeah, do no, you know? no, really? I can't think of any off the top of my head, and purely because women don't make enough money to be able to have mm. that kind of power. The the female players, you know, in the, in, and even just the women's leagues, like any league you think of, not a single player makes enough money to be able to yeah. do that. What Mbappe does or what Ronaldo does, they make yeah. enough money, you know, whether it's weekly or per season, per year, or whatever to be able to turn around and be like, if you don't do this, I'm walking away because they financially, they just, they just have more power. Yeah. I mean, and Anton is supposed to follow up maybe in the future, they'll have more wealth and status and powers, but not yet. But yeah. for me, it's not even about having more status than the club, like a Ronaldo and Mbappe did. It's just about the, the baseline level respect and the way you want to be treated. And uh, I know Vicky said something about sort of, Oh, Namra, the problem is emotional abuse isn't taken seriously. So I feel like, I mean, I don't know if you want to step into this, uh, Kudzi, but the, I mean, I think we all know about like Paul Riley and mm. because that was reported very, um, you know, in the BBC that was reported in mainstream that he'd yeah. done these 
he was the one who did the against Erin Simon, was it him or was it? I can't. I don't yeah, know. No, it. That's, it, yeah. that's it. Yeah. So he sexually assaulted her, and yeah. you know that is the extreme. That is oh, that, like he's banned for life. Yeah. But then there was the, I think he was at the Washington, was he? Where he wasn't, but he would just talk down to them, minimise yeah. them. A lot of them had to go to, to therapy and still yeah. go into therapy now because of the way he just spoke to them. Yeah. So I what I think it is, is um, it's like, I'm going to center it around, you know, the US because that's where I'm at. But this is yeah. prevalent anywhere in any sport. I think what people now are realizing is a lot of the way whether it's men or women are coached is not right. Like, for example, you were talking about Washington spirits. So that was Richie Burke. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit as well about Farid Betsiti, who was at uh, OL Reign, which is the team I support here. Um, when he was at PSG, his coaching methods weren't good. And he ended up um, having issues with Lindsay Horan, who wrote an opiate piece about it. it. I can't remember if it was the player's voice of the athletic. I can't remember which one it was. But um, she spoke about how he spoke to her and his coaching methods and how they were, you know, they were emotionally abusive because he was talking about her weight and stuff like that. And then he got hired by the OL Reign. And um, again, we don't know real specifics, but he wasn't, he hadn't changed. He said he changed, but he hadn't changed. And, he, and then he didn't have the results to back using that kind of coaching technique, if we can call it that. So he got fired. But the way it is now is that people are beginning to realize that, um, and uh, you know what, actually, I'll do this. I'm going to talk about um, Mike Tomlin. If anyone follows the NFL, Mike Tomlin is the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He doesn't give a lot of interviews, but he did one really long interview and he was talking about coaching. And he's like, you always hear about coaches saying, oh, I can't coach him. They're uncoachable. Or I can't coach her. They're uncoachable. And everything I've tried doesn't work or whatever, you know, and they'll, you know, they'll say things to them about their personalities or their physical appearance or whatever it is. And he's like, that's not good coaching because if you're supposed to be a coach and you're saying this player is uncoachable, it means that you can't coach. It's not that they're uncoachable. It means you can't coach because you haven't found a way to reach them to make them play at their full potential. So if you're a manager or a coach or even a trainer and you have to resort to being emotionally abusive or, um, you know, to the worst levels, right? Sexually abusive and stuff like that. And that means you're not a coach. You're not a manager and you shouldn't be in the job. Yeah, no, 100%. And I mean, Andy, I don't know if you, but I look at someone like, I mean, I'm not saying he did this, but, you know, times have changed the way that we do speak to people, like we say in employment law. But, you know, even I look at, I know you probably won't like this, but, you know, Fergie, yeah. he used to be really tough and, People even say now in the men's game, oh, you know, that style, you know, Jose probably doesn't work as much anymore. These kind of, obviously, I know he's working still, but they have to, they have to adapt, they have to do this, they have to change the way. And I suppose just for Andy, I mean, I mean, when you're hearing this kind of stuff and, you know, Ricky's posting things, what, what do you, you know? Building on what you just said about, about Fergie, I think the class of 92 were the last generation to clean the senior players' boots and, Sweep the mm. stands and things like that. Now they talk about that fondly. They talk about that as keeping them grounded, working the way up, feeling what it's like to be part of this big thing before they're ready to actually play. Um, but that's easy. That also makes it easy to take advantage of people. You know, there are there are good sides to it and bad sides to it. It's it's good to keep people grounded when they're in this bubble that certainly men's football is, where from a six a six year old you're being told you're the best player and at your age group and you're gonna go on to make a fortune. You, it's almost unfair to judge players' attitudes based on their upbringing. Mm -hmm. How are they supposed to see outside that bubble? And women's football probably doesn't have that yet. Hopefully it won't be so ingrained in them that you are better, you are better, you will you, know, you will run the world, don't listen to anybody. You want modesty still, but you want to build them up and support every kind of growth a person can go through. So it, there's, a, there's a fine balance every way and, and there's compatibility as well. There are some things that will work for some people and some that won't work for others. Yeah. And that's part of coaching. If, yeah. if, you, if you can't coach somebody, the professional approach is to recognise that you can't coach them, recognise the qualities, but it's okay to not know how to use somebody, to not be able to get the best out of somebody. If you recognise that, act professionally, tell them the truth, be honest and open. It's not necessarily a shortcoming to say, don't know how to use this girl don't know how to use this lad 
it's it's about how you respond to situations rather than the situation themselves. Yep. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. And there's just a question in here, uh, sporting much thought face again. I think I know who you are. I'm thinking. But I suppose when we were talking about unions, I don't know if you think, could, see, could there be a sp uh, specific issue encountered by FEMA if I suppose... I don't know because there's the thief pro, isn't there? Um, We've seen with the with the Spanish women, they've gone to thief pro, and that's supposed to be a bit more global. Yeah, and they're still not getting. What I think they it want de it depends on it depends on who's in charge of the unions, right? Mm -hmm. And how much not only who's in charge of them, but how much power they can wield. So, for example, in the NWSL, they didn't have a players' union until very very recently, about a year or two ago. That's when they came together and said, "We're going to have a union for our players." So you can imagine how much stuff was put under the rug, swept under the rug from when the league was first put together, which was 2013 up until now, right? Because they didn't have a union. They didn't have union reps in their teams to be able to go to and say, listen, we need to fix A, B, C, and D. So the thing is now with the Players Association, they have the power to be able to enact change. They can go to the league and say, these, this, these are all the things we need to fix. How do we fix them? How long is it going to take? Because we need to now go back to the players and say, here we are. This is this is the plan. This is how it's going to go. So when you have a global institution, a global union, yes, you have FIFA Pro, but how much power do FIFA Pro have? We don't know, right? We we are yet to see them in a situation where they have to kind of flex their muscles, so to speak. And until we see that, we don't know how much power they have. So yes, the Spanish, uh, the players in the Spanish national team have gone to FIFA Pro, but is FIFA Pro powerful enough to go to FIFA and say, can you talk to the Spanish Federation and mm -hmm. sort this out? We don't know. I mean, just talking about the Spanish situation, um, I recently heard something that um, Mappy Leon said, and she says they had then discussions, but nothing's happened from it. So yeah. it's like you say, they're not powerful enough to go to to the Spanish Federation and say that and see change. And, you know, I know Vicky's just posted here the things that he's done, you know, leaving the door open at night so he could check and he could lock the door and... Mm turn the lights off it's just it's 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 one of those things that you wouldn't even think about and yeah. it's happening now now yeah. that's happened now you know and you know you're talking about the players union in in thing and, and i've seen it and i know there's the, the black players union i suppose mm -hmm. just your view on on it could see because in the, for me as well like i heard about the black players union and i thought oh god that's something that'd be great here and i know that Fern Whelan is, is doing a lot for um, the PFA. Yeah. Uh, she's a mixed race woman, but she, you know, is an ex-player who's just, just literally finished and she's doing a lot to try and improve for players. But we're seeing with the, the WSL, things are coming out. We're seeing about maternity play. It depends on which club you're at, really, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't matter in a way. What What's your view on, I suppose, the players' union that you have in NWSL now and, I suppose, the PFA? Because sometimes... I feel like it's very conservative. That, mm. uh, yeah, so so the way the players' union was set up here is um, because the, and you know this, women's football is a very closed community. Like, everyone knows everyone. Obviously, as the game grows, that's not going to be the same anymore. But right now, everyone knows everyone. So when they put together the players' union, they were able to put together um, people who almost every player felt like, yes, I'm represented by this person. I can come to this person and they can take it to the union and the union will know exactly what to do. And they also had the right legal representation to be able to argue on their behalf because that's the other thing, right? Whoever's in the PFA for you guys and is in charge of like looking after the women's players, the female players, sorry. Um, do they have the right kind of surrounding around them to be able to do what they need to do? Do they have the right legal representation? Do they have the right PR people around them? Do they have the right people who know the union language, all that kind of stuff? Is it all there around them for them to be able to do their jobs? In this case, with the NWSLPA, they do. So when they were putting together, um, for example, we just had the, uh, the first collective bargaining agreement that the league has ever had, right? The PA had the people around them to be able to craft it, present it to the league and say, you know, we're going to argue, we're going to stand on these principles. You either take them or you don't, and this league falls apart. So the choice is yours. But they stood by what they wanted and they fought as long as they possibly could the, with all the right channels and everything like that to be able to get the win they needed. So in the PFA, like again, I'm not there, so I don't know the ins and outs of it, but 
does do they have that kind of support around them in the PFA? Because the PFA, assuming, is was started because of the men's players, right? So the people in charge will predominantly be looking at the men's game. That's their viewpoint. That's their mindset. Are there enough people around the women's game to be able to say, okay, we need to enact these changes? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> you guys would know better than me. What do you think, Andy? Because I know my opinion. What do you think? I suspect not. Right. And the power in any union is with the members, and the members need to have the say on who represents them. And it takes a lot of courage to be the one that says, I will be a rep, especially in the established PFA that's male orientated to for for a female footballer to go up and say i will be a rep if you offer a service to to female footballers that's a hugely courageous thing for in in any in any trade in any kind of work in the world to stand up and say i will represent the people it takes courage but to with the disparity between men and women historically in football it's a long way from being equal in a lot of ways so it, it would take some very brave people to stand up and a lot of people to be on the same page and get together and and push for that and demand it yeah yeah and should all right here you go namra has got a question should the way fans support a team um and their players be vastly different women's to men's team i suppose could see what do you think I muted myself. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think when you're a fan, we always talk about how football is football. It doesn't matter what level you're watching it. But I think you do have to take it contextually when it comes to the women's game because of the lack of player power. And because so many people still involved in the women's game kind of see it as, oh, they're doing the female players a favor. They're not actually treating it as a business. They're not treating it as a, an actual sporting industry like men's football is. Because, like, if we're completely honest, that's what football has become. Men's football has become. It's become a business now. So there's not enough people who see women's football as a business. It's changing, but there's still not enough people in positions of power who still see who see it as a business. They still see it as, I'm doing a favor for my daughter and her friends kind of thing, right? So as fans, you always have to take that into account that you're giving money to people who might not necessarily have the right mindset when it comes to how they support the team. So in, for example, Manchester United board, we don't know how they really view the women's team because so far they've shown us that they just see it as a side project, not as an actual entity that they can make money from. The teams that thrive are the ones, easy example, Lyon, the manager, the, sorry, the owner of the, of the club went all in and he said, I don't care if the women's game hasn't caught up to me the women's game has to catch up to me. I'm not going to try and lower my team down to the level that the women's game is at. I'm going to do everything in my power that I can financially to support the women's team. There's not enough owners who treat it like that. And when we get to that position, then fans can start to change their mentality. But until then, I think fans just have to take into account that because of the lack of player power, and this is not just in the NWSL, but across the world, the lack of player power means that the players don't have the voice they need to have to be able to enact the change they need as players. Mm -hmm. And because now we have to start seeing them as not just, oh, you know, our favorite player or whatever, but they're now professional athletes and professional athletes need certain things. But until they get the power to be able to ask for those things, fans have kind of the responsibility and the media and so forth have the responsibility to be that player power until the players have. Mm. I mean, what, what do you think, I suppose, Andy, on that question should because we have come from it from the men's game like totally and you know I was even like Moyes bum back no matter what you know back no matter what and now like what Namara is saying I feel just I don't know just feel like like Vicky's saying they need more support what, what, what do you think? I think that phrase no matter what I think that has different brackets and I think if you're talking football activities then I will back the manager if I think he's good enough, I think he's trying to do the right things, I will back the manager. Then there's the bracket of what does he do behind closed doors? Is he treating players well? Or she, not just Mark Skinner, but anybody, any manager that finds themselves in a position of power could potentially abuse it. So I think it's that the no matter what is we don't consider that side of it in men's football because, because men 
male footballers probably aren't as vulnerable. I mean, there, there are examples of of being taken advantage of in different ways, but it's certainly on a different level to, to women's football. So no matter what, never really, it was never really a big phrase. But in women's football, there's, there's obvious things going on that that fall outside of that no matter what. And it's there's the football side and there's the human side. And football is humans. And you've got to think about how to treat people and then think about how to treat a footballer within the realms of how you can treat people. So no matter what, in a football term, yeah, I'll back the manager no matter what. No matter what, in a human term, absolutely not. There are lots of things that can be done that no matter how good somebody is, no matter what results they get, fall outside of your sport. 100%, 100%. I could say I just um, want to say, touch, I suppose, on a, on a um, I suppose, coming back to this channel, Man United, <laughs> and I know you've said Orlando before. Yeah. You, you had, you've experienced Mark and his management style. And I just suppose, I want to get your take on how it went at Orlando and what, what happened there and, I know obviously Man United came along, et cetera, et cetera. Probably didn't end as well, but just mm. how he's perceived there, I suppose, in the end of his well, because he was there, maybe not when Paul Ryan, I don't know if he was there when all this stuff was happening or what, yeah. or just, I suppose, your take on that. Yeah, so he was there for a little bit of it, if I remember correctly, just timing-wise, but I don't think he would know the ins and outs of it because unless, like, a player told him, right? And then we wouldn't know that unless player or himself they say anything so for now let's just assume he didn't know because yeah he, he wouldn't have known um in terms of mark skinner the man they had no problem with him as far as i understand it in terms of players and, and people in orlando the fans as a person they had no issues with him whatsoever of course that soured a little bit when he left for manchester united and, and the way he left um because you know he just kind of left in like a week basically but yeah Apart from that, as as a person, as a as a as a coach and stuff, they never had any issues with him. The issue came on how he wanted to play his football. That's where the problem would come up because he had an idea in his head of how football should be played, and he either didn't get the players that he needed to make it happen, or he did refuse to adapt to the fact that his style wouldn't work in the league. So I think if we're going to talk about how they viewed him, I would say that that in case like the the, the 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 person that he is, no one had a problem with him. But in terms of tactically as a manager, yeah, there was a lot of gaping holes there. And um, I remember, I want to say it was 2018 or 2019, I can't remember when, but I did do a piece on, um, he had come out with some statement or phrase or something like that. And I don't remember the, the specifics of that phrase, but it was something like, oh, I want to create art with how I, I, I do my football, something like that. And I, I, I won't lie, he was like a laughing stock for that because people were like, what is that? What does that mean? Because we're not seeing it on the, on, the, on the pitch. So what are you trying to say? What are you trying to show us, this art that you're trying to show us? Because the way you play, the way you want the teams to play, that's not artistic. That's not beautiful football. That's, it, it doesn't look anything like that. So in terms of tactics, yeah, he, he I, to be honest, I think he just failed to adapt to the league. He had a way he wanted to play. And if you're Pep Guardiola, good for you. You can make other people adapt to your style. But he's not Pep Guardiola. So he had to, like, adapt to the league. And I think um, an easy, easy example of what I mean by that is Laura Harvey, when she first came to the league, she had a way that she wanted football to be played. And then she realized very quickly in that first season that it wasn't going to work. It just was not going to work. So she had to adapt. So after that, she brought in... I think the first season they had a, a losing season, a pretty bad losing season. I think they only won one or two games under Laura Harvey. And then after that, she realized that, okay, I have to make changes, not just to how I play tactically, but even the players that we bring in, as you know, in, in the NWSL, we draft players and then we sign players as well. So a lot of the players come from the college system. They don't just come from people signing them. And then she realized all of that. And then come 2014, 2015, she put together the team that she wanted to play the football that not only she wanted, but the football that would work in the league. And I think Mark Skinner failed to do that. So by the time United came rolling around, yes, he wanted to go back because it's United and so forth. But at the same time, I think 
for Orlando, they realize that, okay, this guy is probably not going to change how he wants to play his football. So while we don't want him to go, is it so bad if he goes? I think that's how the fans were like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very stubborn. Very stubborn, man. That's how I... <laughs> and now he plays and now he does this. This is sort of how I'm going to play. I mean, I'm saying something. don't know how what you think could see and Slater, but Casey's style suits it more. But I don't know. Casey seems a bit more flexible. That's just it. Yeah, sorry. I'll just interject really. Um, you oh, can fine. see the style that Casey Stoney has with San Diego is not exactly what she had with United. It's similar in, in, in the way that they that she likes to play a lot of transition football and the way she uses Alex Morgan and, and um, um, Sophia Jacobson and uh, what's this this little player, this baby player, Jaden Shaw. There we go. Um, so the way she uses those forwards, it's similar to how she was trying to do things at United, especially when she had like Kristen Press around and so forth. Um, so, But with her, the, the key is she's adaptable and she's realized that, okay, in this league, you need to play in a certain way if you want to get results. Because um, not to make it seem like they're all just like, you know, kick the ball and run kind of thing. That's not the NWSL. But if you don't know how to play at a quick pace, you're going to, you're not going to be able to compete in the NWSL. You have to be able to keep up because it goes like full throttle from the first whistle to the very last. And so you need players who have great engines. You need players who are tactically sound, but also technically sound and who can last basically playing at full speed for 90 minutes. And I think Casey Stoney realized that before she came to the league. So when she got to the league, she knew what she needed and drafted well and you know signed players well to be able to put together a team like that. Whereas Mark Skinner refused to see that and he stayed the way that he wanted to stay and play and it led to Orlando not doing well. Mm-hmm. I mean, Slayer, just bring you in after what, what Kudz has said. I mean, Nam said he seems like a nice guy, but Vicky Hayes sort of said needs a mix of management with some females in the mix. I don't know what, I suppose, what you think sort of, I suppose on Mark and and how it's going and and I suppose then back it like just how we were talking about him and think, his stubbornness. I suppose. <laughs> I think is some of the things he says, not necessarily the things he says, but the way he says things. Like Kudzi was talking about the want to create art. It's you know if Eric Cantona says that, you listen to him mm-hmm. because he's just, he's earned it. Now Mark Skinner might earn that, but a lot of the stuff he says sounds almost hippie like you know it sounds like he's, <laughs> he's, he's been you know he's not shy of a of a quick you know chilling out period <laughs> i'm not accusing accusing but he has that persona about the, the the language he uses sometimes and that's not my cup of tea but as long as the football works and um, i think the football has improved under him uh, i've retrospectively read little bits about his time at orlando and while the overall record looked pretty poor it did seem to develop from what I've read. It went from dreadful to getting better and had a pretty decent unbeaten run towards the end. Uh, not necessarily winning games, but certainly a, a good unbeaten run. So I think it did take the steps. And if Mark's going to went to the NWSL and put a new team together, maybe he could do better and put the players together that play the way he wants. But he went to an existing team where he had to bring players in over to his his ideas uh, you know it's a slightly different challenge um, you, you, you need a lot of focus and talent to do both things building a new team from scratch which Casey had already done uh, you know she built United and she went and probably learned some learned from some mistakes when doing that and went and built another team with more experience and basically had the pick of, of who she wanted rather than give, being given a set team that you're asking to adapt. Uh, managers have to adapt and players have to adapt regardless. I feel like Mark has adapted over his time at United. I think he's at, at the beginning, there was, you know, we had no width at all and everybody seemed to recognise it. And then, strangely enough, a game away at Brighton where we played like five central midfielders, we had the most width we'd ever had in a match. And I think I like the interchangeability of, of his teams. There's not, I think with Casey, you've got players in positions and it's a, a, bit, a bit more straightforward. Mm-hmm. So it's probably easier to to grasp and think, right, this is my job. This is what I'm going to do. But I think Mark wants, he wants to instruct, but he wants players to think for themselves as well and, and know when to stay in position, when to interchange with somebody else. So I think that leaves you open for a lot more 
bad performances. And I think we're seeing a lot of progress in not understanding that and and now going and and finding your way, knowing where you should be and where your partner's going to be. So I think he has adapted a little bit and players have adapted as well and grown into the style of football. Yeah, I think as well, potentially what you said earlier on about Casey, she'd done that before. She she had built a team before and I feel like Mark, maybe what he has learned at Orlando and trying to make players buy in, he's maybe taken now to Man United because he did come and that wasn't his team and it was it was Casey's team. I mean, even though Nam's sort of saying, hey, he doesn't seem to trust his signings. Uh, he seems to like Casey's signings a lot more. It is... Um, yeah, I mean, Peter's saying here how open defence are at times. Um, yeah, but I think it's taken a lot. It's taken a long time to adapt. Man United, maybe he's been given more, given more money in the way he wants to play it. Like you say, maybe at Orlando with the draft, it's, it's more difficult. Yeah, well, I, I just, just go on. I, I wouldn't say that we are open at the back. I would say no. that we make silly mistakes. All three goals that we conceded against Chelsea were individual errors. Uh, one of Arsenal's goal was a good ball over and a great finish. The other one was a, a slightly poor attempt at a block, which deflected in. I think we're more prone to individual errors than we are open at the back. I think we defend as a unit quite well, but we do have lapses in concentration. So I think the unit. Works. Yeah, I do think your unit works. It's yeah, just... I think with Mark Skinner, I think if you decide to bring him on doesn't matter what team it is whether it's united or orlando or whatever you need to be prepared to wait quite a while for what he wants to do as a as a manager tactically for it to to actually develop because not only does he need to then decide whether the players that he has will work with what he wants to do or not or whether he should bring in new people or whatever but even when he does bring in new people they have to adapt to his style right and like as, as a liverpool supporter Klopp does it a lot right he'll bring in players some will start straight away, but others need time to adapt to what he wants. And then after they've adapted, he brings them into a team. So with Mark Skinner, you have to be prepared to be patient, I think. is is And in Orlando, unfortunately, he didn't have – it's only as just before he left United when they were starting to draw a lot of games. And then from there, you know, he started to put together something. But when you come into the league and you say certain things and you raise expectations to a certain level, which he did, um, you don't have as much patience. I think if he had just been, I don't want to say humble because that, that's not quite the right word, but if he had just been a little bit more cognizant of what he was telling the fans, they would have had a lot more patience with him. The players would have a lot more patience with him. But because of the way he words things sometimes, you just kind of look at what's going on and what he's saying and you're saying that's, that's not working, that's not jiving, that's not matching what you're saying. So for United fans, I would say, yeah, you, you, I think you're going to need a lot of patience with him. But I think once it clicks, it'll click. But until then, you're just going to have to be really patient and then try to figure out when he says things, try to figure out, like, to pass through all his words and see exactly what he was trying to say and not so much all the flowery stuff around it. Yeah. Yeah. Flower is the right word. Yeah. <laughs> fluff, I call it. You call it fluff. Yeah. I call it fluff. But just some things, sometimes he does say, and this is where it then, I suppose, goes back to what we were saying at the start. Any, for example... He, the way he talks about players, I, sometimes I don't like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it can sound condescending. I mean, there was a time where he says, players need to deserve to play for Man United. I get what you're saying, you know. But then a player then came out and says, everyone deserves to play. You know, I just, yeah. it was just very, um, as a, as a Yeah, as a general rule, I don't like it when managers come out and do that, whether it's, it's at my own club uh, or I, I don't like it because you're not doing that player any favors, right? You're, you're just making, uh, if they have some kind of resentment against you, you're making it worse. So whether it works for Mark Skinner or not, I don't know. But just me personally, I don't like it when managers do that. See, I think again with that, it depends on knowing the player. Yeah. If you know a player will respond to that kind of challenge, then that's good management. If you get that wrong, it can look like bad management and possibly be bad management. It's about knowing the players as individuals and knowing... Who needs challenging? Who needs pushing? And who needs encouragement? And you see it with with United men, the way Mourinho treated Shaw, like he was a, you know, he was holding a remote control at the side of the pitch and had to control him like on FIFA. <laughs> he wouldn't 
but then Shaw had some cracking games and some bad games, and he's you know he's, he's consistently been one of the better players at United and and as a fullback with with bad patches. So I think there's lots of examples of you know trying to manage an individual. I think you're going to get it wrong sometimes, but hopefully you get a feeling of challenge and you think, yeah, all right, I'll show you that I can. Or you get somebody who says, that's not fair. I mean, saying everybody deserves to play, that's that's the fluff. Everybody doesn't deserve to play. There's 11 spots yeah. and some players aren't good enough to take those 11 spots. The substitute positions, of course, but it's a, it's a case of knowing who to challenge and we'll see what works and what doesn't. Yeah. yeah, I would say I think um, for United fans, because you know this is primarily what we're here to talk about. I would say that, um, like I mentioned before, with Mark Skinner, you just need a lot of patience, right? If you feel as a fan you're seeing improvement, then you know you can feel like okay, I'm going to back the manager. But if you, as a fan, see you you don't think there's a lot of improvement, there's no development, then I can see why you're very frustrated with him. But yeah, I would just say he needs a lot of patience and. If it was my team, like, for example, if he was coaching Liverpool, I would just ignore his press conferences. <laughs> I would ignore them and just be like, okay, well, what am I seeing on the pitch? Am I seeing improvement on the pitch? If yes, then I'm fine. If no, then I have a problem. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I think that's what a lot of fans have done now. I think a lot of people just don't listen at all. <laughs> Full stop. Um, so, yeah. Whether the media team will like that, I don't know. <laughs> but no, this is just one question and then, it, then we'll wrap it up. And Andy, you can come in at any point as well. But could see Lanzel saying something. And in uh, Orlando, you did yeah. have a lot, didn't you? You had Marty, yeah. you had Alex Morgan, you had uh, the goalkeeper, forget a name, but you Ashlyn know, Harris, yeah. Ashlyn Harris. And there, I mean, God, Ashlyn is very out yeah. there, talkative, <laughs> you know, yeah. very. So that's, I suppose, Lanzel's worry. And What's I suppose your take on how he managed those players? I suppose. Um, I think I would say, again, with um during his time at Orlando, I think when he first came in, he didn't know how to manage them. He didn't, and that's not to say that he can't or he was just a terrible manager. No, because when he during his time at was it Birmingham? Was it Birmingham? Yeah. Okay. During his time at Birmingham, I don't think he had those kind of personalities like that. At, or, or at least. Maybe he had one or two, but not as many as he had in Orlando. He had players that were at the peak of their game that were regarded. And you know you know this about the, the women's national team in America. They're considered as celebrities, right? Like everywhere they go, people know where they are. They're followed around by TMZ or whatever, right? So I don't think he'd ever had to deal with those kind of personalities in those locker rooms before. And especially personalities where they know how to win. They're used to winning. So when they're not winning they're probably not going to be great people <laughs> to be around at that time. So I would say that if it happens at United where he has a lot of international players there, I think yeah. during his time at Orlando, I think he's learned how to deal with that. I think he'll be, I don't know if he'll be 100% successful, but I think he'll be better at it than he was at, in Orlando. And I think what he eventually discovered was a way to communicate with those um, big personalities to say to them, I know it's not working right now, but trust me, have faith in me, have patience, and it'll eventually work. And I think you could see that by the time he left, the players were not happy that he left, right? They wanted him to stay. So it means he had managed to win them over. So I think, again, same thing, patience, patience, patience. Mm. And I don't know if you want to come in on anything or? Yeah, I, th I think it's not always a case of having to manage a team full of an, and a bench full of international stars. It's a case of, identifying the qualities in a player that will do a job in your system. They don't have to be the best player in the world. United men over the years have had some, on the paper, bang average players who have been pivotal to the success over the course of a season. And I think from what I see on the pitch, we seem to be a team that plays for the manager that does the things that the manager wants. And I think some of his comments after games, I think... People complain about shortcomings in a game. And Skinner seems to recognise those same things and talk about them after the match. But then he gets slagged off for letting those things happen. Now, I'd much rather this season be picking up points while finding the things to improve on than dropping two points every other game and finding things to improve on. So I think we're in a great position where you know we're winning. For the most part, we're winning and we're improving at the same time. 
And I think that shows, I see on the pitch myself that players are playing his way and have bought in. And there are players that I'd like to see more of. But if we're winning, you know, am I going to say that he's winning the wrong way? He should be winning with this player and that player or playing this kind of football? No. <laughs> I'd love to, there are players that I'd love to see more of. You know, I'm, I think I'd love to love to have seen Jade Moore get more of a look in. I think she was a properly solid midfielder who, she, you know, she's not a superstar, but she looked like a player who, you know, very similar to Hayley Ladd, but more openly tough rather than subtly tough. And I'd like to see that, but it didn't, you know, she didn't get to play very much. She hasn't had that many appearances. Yeah. I but mean, if we're winning, if we're winning yeah. I accept that completely. You know, go ahead, keep doing what you're doing. It's looking good to me. People are talking about in the comments just about Emma Hayes and the rotation. And I suppose, could see, I just want to touch. I know you're in Canada and we talk, we talked about Jade a bit at the start, Jade Riviere. And we've obviously got a Canada player, Adriana Leon. And mm. I mean, just from we had Graham on before, and what I've heard, she sort of wants those assurances that she's going to get game time. I don't think she came in and thought she was not probably going to get the minutes that she got. I think someone worked it out. It's like, 100 minutes or something, yeah. you know, it's not a lot. And then I get where Andy's coming from, yeah. But at the same time, I think the subs can be better, can be quicker, can be, yeah. you know, he brought on Leon, I think, versus Chelsea for five minutes. And I just, for me, I think that's more disrespectful to her than sort of trying to give her a minute. I just think, you know, I just, so I just could say before you go, thank you very much for coming on, but just let, I suppose, just the take of Leon and anything that you know about her and, and things like that. Yeah, um, so in terms of just the overall, um, I guess, viewpoint or, or look that we're having in Canada is, yeah, we feel like she's not getting enough minutes. And, you know, it's World Cup year. She needs to be getting more minutes, right? If she, like, uh, and Bev Peaceman would want to have her have more minutes so that, you know, they, she can play and start and make an impact for Canada, right? Because they feel that they're at the p place and position that they have enough players and quality to be able to really have a go at it. So I don't know what's going on there with Skinner and Leon. I, like I said, I'm not a United fan. I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know what he told her when she signed, but I'm pretty sure it's not this. Coming on five minutes against Chelsea, I don't think it was that. I think that from what I've seen of United, and granted, I think I've watched one full match, which was the one against Arsenal. Um, I, think, I think he's doing the right things. It's, it's, He's got something in place that I'm impressed by that I never saw in Orlando. I'll be completely honest. I didn't think he was capable of putting together a team that could do that, where not only were they essentially going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Arsenal, but they had it within themselves. They had the fight and the belief within themselves to say, we can still win this game. And they went on and won the game, right? And you didn't really... In Orlando, they would draw a lot, but they didn't seem to have that final like click or final step to be able to say, okay, we're going to go win this game. So in terms of just his overall management with like Leon and things like that, I, I can't really speak to it too much, except that she needs more minutes. Full stop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it, as much as I am a fan of her and would like to see Leon more as well, I want to see Garcia. And I, I feel like she <laughs> is the first choice. Yeah. When she's not injured, I feel like she is the first choice. Paris isn't a bad player to have playing on that side either when, when you need to. I'd rather see her through the middle more, but is she going to displace Russo? We've got a lot of... We've got a wealth of talent up front. Which isn't a bad thing. <laughs> no, it's not a bad thing at all, but it yeah. means that some players are going to get fewer minutes than you expect. I do think he could make substitutions earlier, but then the results contradict that. I still think it. You know, when I'm watching a game, I'm thinking of a change here, somebody fresh on... But if that doesn't happen and we still win the game, then I'm not going to complain. I'm happy with his decisions if it leads to a win, as long as it doesn't lead to fatigue further down the line. But then we've got good players who can cover and rotate if fatigue does kick in. So, yeah, I, I want to see certain players more, but unless that causes us to drop points, then I'm, I'm not going to cry about it. Yeah. I just want to say I'm, I'm going to come into the other chat, but could say thank you so much for joining us and I suppose giving that overview of what's happening and what you think fans should do and I suppose touching on a, a few um, a few of our players. But yeah, we hope you don't get to get three points Sunday. 
That's the one I hope not. Want. I hope not. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping yeah. it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you no. so much. If you ever want to come on again, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, really no, thank you. Th thanks for having me. Um, I wish I had more time than I. We could really kind of go through a lot more. Unfortunately, yeah. I don't. But if if I would just leave like one final statement with the fans, because that's what we're here to really talk about, I would just say just exercise a bit more patience with him. I haven't watched a lot of United, but from what I've seen. He seems to be on the right track. So as long as he's winning you games and he's pushing you towards, which I'm assuming is Champions League, is what the fans want, give him time. Give him patience. Give him time. And, you know, if he hasn't done so in the next, like, two, three seasons, then you can really start to worry. But for now, he seems to be on the right track. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah no worries. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. See you, everyone. See you soon. Because he's just stepped out. John, we will wrap it up, but... I just seen something from um, Naaman, I suppose. What was your view, though, on everything that was said? To, said Andy, does it make you feel a bit more? You know, I don't know because, like I said, uh, there was a lot of talk about we need to back him no matter what. And I know you said you do explain that, but I mean, just I suppose listening to everything that's gone on and what's what's your view? Is it changed at all, or is it still? This, you know what's no, I, I think he is a, a process kind of manager, you know, like like Van Gaal was for the men's team, but that didn't really develop. You know, it, it's something that takes time to implement. And mm -hmm. there were there were frustrations last season, but this season I think it's been a huge stride forward. So I'm you know, I'm I'm not on board with the fluff, but if that's his character, that's his character. I'm delighted with how the football's going. The, the win against Arsenal, you know, when when, when we lost to Chelsea and, and the start of that run of four games, it makes you think, this again, what what do the next three games bring? And then that win against Arsenal just flipped it. It just flipped the the momentum that you were worried was going to start come crashing down uh, to the point where a draw against City was disappointing. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm still disappointed by it. I, I thought, and straight after that match, I thought, I'm fuming, but I'll probably see it as not a bad result tomorrow, but I'm still fuming. That was a game that was totally now. winnable. You know, and, that's, that's yeah. how expectations are there because that's how good we are playing. And yeah. there are points for improvement as well. So there's, I think there's a long way to go for the team. But I feel like you know, if we get top three, it's you know, you, you want then a good performance in the Champions League. Mm -hmm. But just proving that you're in the top three teams in the country, that's a big step to say, look where we are. Now it's your turn to try and catch us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Nam's just touched on something. I don't know if this is it because I saw then Vicky say, and I just want to just take your final thoughts. Do you think it's probably a difference between a man or a woman? We're seeing that, and and maybe where he's saying things, if a woman was saying it, would be different. Or do you think no? It's just like what Cudi said. We just need to get behind him, and obviously, like you said, they didn't mind him at at, at Orlando. But you know, everyone's different, isn't it? Or what, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a very fair point. You know, if, if you see two people, you know, if you saw a men's manager of a men's team swearing at the players, you wouldn't think anything of it. If you saw a male manager of a women's team swearing at the players, you might think, hang on, show a bit of respect. And, you know, what do the female players think of that? Do they want to be dollified and, you know, you, you're a lady, you, you, you shouldn't have to hear that stuff? I mean, look at, Look at the lit reading of Jill Scott in the Euros final, that famous scene. You know, in some senses, you don't want to see that on telly, but in a lot of other senses, that's great to see. You know, that's somebody letting out their emotion and, and feeling able to do it. And I think that there is a big perception thing. Like when I started watching women's football, if our tackle went in, there were times I thought, I wonder if she's all right. And, you know, that is, that's underlying sexism. I'll admit that. But that was your perception because I'd never watched it before, only because there wasn't a United team. And that's where you think, hang on a minute, why am I thinking that? That's ridiculous. Get him, go on, get stuck in. And it, and I think that's all these small things that make people realise what the things they think actually mean will help to push attitude forward. And I think that it was still at a point where that probably would be seen differently, a man blazing at, at a woman's team than a woman. No worries. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to wrap Thank it up. Thank you, everyone, for watching.
Um, I think it was a good show, and I think definitely it touched me the thing about that we do need to to listen and we do need to think. I think we're seeing with the the the, the, the Spanish players this this isn't over. I know that big, you know, more things will come out. It's not just an end of yourself. It's not just the Spanish things are probably going on in this league that we don't know. And you know, like you say, as soon as you hear something, you should be we should be investigating. We should be talking about it. So I just. You know, because you don't want it then to get to a point where there's sexual assaults and things like that because they're not being listened to about something basic. I'm not saying that's got, but you know, things like that, and that's it. And you know, we're seeing it more. It's coming in papers. We're seeing, you know, Emma. I can't remember her name, but she's talked about it, lack of maternity care, and then we've now seen a backtrack kind of a bit. And it's just like, no, no, no. You, you said what you said. We should be fully behind it. And I think. You know, like you say, the Lioness is one. It's not just about them. It's about the whole league and, and we're seeing that. And, you know, thank you guys for, for, for joining us and drop a like in, like, share, subscribe. Obviously, could see a name still going down the bottom. Check out Andy and the Barmy article, you know, go and buy that today. But is there any parting for, for words from you, mate, or just the same? I think that the same in, not just in football, but in all walks of life, there is power in a union. And, I think in the world we're living at the minute, that's as important as ever, and specifically in in women's football for that representation to happen. No, no worries. Yes, thank you, guys. Drop the like on, share, subscribe. See you soon. <laughs>